Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on Organic Methods for Control of Insect Pests and Diseases of Pecan and Peach by David Shapiro Ilan and Clive Bach of the USDA ARS Fruit and Tree Nut Research Laboratory in Byron, Georgia. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. David Shapiro Ilan is a research entomologist with the USDA ARS. His research focuses on using microbial biocontrol agents to suppress insect pests with emphasis on the pests of pecan and peach. Dr. Shapiro Ilan has published more than 120 scientific articles and book chapters on biological control of insect pests. Clive Bach is a research plant pathologist also with the USDA ARS. His areas of expertise include plant disease epidemiology and integrated disease management with particular reference to diseases of pecan. He has published 50 scientific articles and book chapters and given numerous presentations to both scientists and stakeholders. Well, thank you for the uh, introduction, Alice. Uh, today's title uh, you already covered, and I'm just going to go straight into. Uh, firstly, I should say by start by saying uh, hello to everyone, and uh, in this brief overview, I just want to confirm that I'll be starting with a description of organic methods to control diseases of pecan and peach, and then uh, Dr. Shapiro Alan will be taking over to do the same with insect pests. I just want to mention a couple of things about these crops before we start. As many of you will know, these are both perennial crops and take a lot of years to bear. So often when you're considering organic production, it's useful to try and take those decisions at planting. That isn't always an option, of course, if one is converting an orchard. An orchard. And of course, major limitations to organic production in these crops are due to pests and diseases. Peach does suffer an awful lot of post-harvest issues as well, and uh, we won't actually be uh, covering those in this particular uh, presentation, uh, but they are something that need to be taken into account too. So I'll be starting with diseases of peach, uh, diseases of pecan. There are several diseases that infect pecan. Uh, I'm going to touch on three or four of them this afternoon. Pecan scab caused by Fusicladium effusum is the single most important disease on pecan. It occurs mostly in the southeast of the US, and it causes the sort of symptoms you see there on the right, um, on the leaves, black spots, which are the lesions caused by the fungus, and on the fruit, large black lesions that can coalesce and cause reduction in fruit size and fruit drop and complete yield loss in extreme uh, seasons. Now, and fracnose, powdery mildew, pitophora, shuck rot are also uh, locally and occasionally important, but we won't be spending very much time talking about those today. The pecan scab life cycle uh, is on this next slide, and if we start down here at the uh, right-hand uh, lower corner, you can see uh, during the winter, autumn winter period, the pathogen overwinters in lesions on the shoots on the tree. And as spring appears, these lesions produce spores that are spread in rainfall and wind onto the fresh young foliage as it is produced by the buds. And there are cycles of disease every, up to every 14 days, depending on availability of rainfall and wind to spread the, spread the pathogen. And those cycles continue through the summer when the fruit is colonized, infected and colonized, and then as autumn comes around again, uh, of course, the fruit is harvested, the leaves are, the leaves are subsides from the trees, and the cycle is repeated uh, onwards thereafter. Now, as far as options for management of pecan scab go, firstly, uh, in dry locations, um, such as in the southwest of the US, scab is not an issue simply because there's not the rain to uh, maintain or spread the disease. And consequently, susceptible cultivars, such as Wichita, can readily be grown uh, really from West Texas onwards out to California. However, in areas that are prone to scab that are somewhat wetter, particularly here in the Southeast, uh, 
scab is a major issue and it's important when planting a new orchard to dis make a decision as to whether or not a resistant cultivar is going to be planted. And if so, uh, that will probably resolve any scab issues for the foreseeable future. But if a, an existing orchard is going to be converted, then it's going to be necessary uh, to consider a scab management um, regime to reduce the amount of scab in that orchard. Now, really, the first, the first option there is resistant cultivars. Um, a second option uh, is top working existing trees with resistant cyan wood. The use of organically acceptable fungicides is a possibility. Biological control um, is one option that's recently been explored and there are some promising results on. And orchard hygiene might play a small role too. Now, as far as uh, resistant cultivars go, there are several available and there are some newer ones that reportedly have high levels of resistance to scab. These include Excel, Mandan, Anlene, Lakota, and Zinna. There are some older resistant cultivars that have been around for several years now and are quite widely grown in the southeast and elsewhere, and include Elliott, Caddo, Kanzar, Macmillan, and Sumner. There is a possibility, some reports, that scab has been seen on Sumner recently, so there may be some loss of resistance there. Um, scab susceptible cultivars to avoid in the southeast, uh, if, if planting a new orchard, include Wichita, Mahan, Apache, Burkett, Candy, Cherokee, Cheyenne, Delmas, Mohawk, and Schley. Uh, those three images uh, towards the left of the screen of the fruit just show the sort of damage that scab can do on a susceptible cultivar. You get a loss of uh, fruit number as well as reduction in fruit size. Now, unfortunately, there is a, a, a history of uh, resistance being lost uh, as the pathogen adapts to the resistant cultivar. So even if you plant a resistant cultivar, it is not a guarantee it will remain resistant for the 50 or 60 or 70 years of its productive life. There is a risk that it uh, will become uh, susceptible and therefore it'll be, it, it will need uh, fungicide application to manage scab. I mentioned top working uh, of susceptible cultivars in orchards that are being converted, and this indeed is a possibility. It's best done on young, vigorous trees. And of course, because it's so labor intensive, it uh, really cannot be done uh, if the acreage is too great. And again, that same list of resistant cultivars are the, are the best ones to use. As far as organically acceptable fungicides go, um, as many of you will be uh, aware, there are several organically acceptable fungicides out there that are used to control various different plant diseases on crops being grown organically. Unfortunately, not very many of these have been tested on pecan, but one that has been tested is Bordeaux mixture. And uh, it's been tested pr primarily against scab, as the next couple of slides will demonstrate. Uh, work began on Bordeaux mixture controlling scab back in the 1920s, and Bordeaux mixture was really the, the mainstay of scab control until the mid-60s when better conventional fungicides became widely available and were perhaps a little bit more efficacious and also had other advantages. But uh, Bordeaux mixture does have some pros for an organic producer of pecan. There's an awful lot of data out there now that confirms its efficacy. It is pretty effective on susceptible cultivars, even in particularly wet years when epidemics are going to be a threat. And of course, the uh, basic ingredients for Bordeaux mixture are readily available. There are some cons to the use of Bordeaux mixture, including uh, risk of defoliation if it's applied during dry periods. Uh, this is a big problem with pecan and did occur on, to many crops during the period when other fungicides were not available. But um, testing did show that low lime mixtures of Bordeaux uh, did reduce the risk of uh, defoliation when it was applied during drier conditions. Of course, Bordeaux mixture is also corrosive to farm equipment and use of it can lead to copper buildup in the soil and copper toxicity. And there are anecdotal reports that uh, black aphids are a bigger problem than, than usual on trees treated with Bordeaux mixture. 
A typical recommended spray program would include a pre-pollination application of a 4 to 1 to 100 mix, followed by um, a first cover application of a 6 to 2 to 100 mix a few days after pollination, and then another four applications at two to three week intervals after each other uh, to maintain as disease-free crop as is possible. Now just to show you some results from uh, a study that was done in 1965, which was towards the end of the uh, Bordeaux mix era. This is from uh, Florida in a wet year when pecan scab was particularly damaging. And if we look at this uh, image or this chart on the lower left-hand side, uh, we're comparing, we're looking at the mean scab index from zero to five, so towards five is very serious disease. And we're looking at three different treatments, uh, a conventional tin-based compound, Duter, Bordomix, and non, a non-treated control. And you can see that the Bordomix actually gave very good control compared to the non-treated, but not as good as a conventional fungicide. And if we look at the, uh, the top right chart, uh, we can see that uh, the percentage of nuts in each class either percent disease-free, percent with light disease, or percent with heavy disease, um, Bordeaux mixture is certainly an effective fungicide. However, there is still a yield uh, penalty for that level of disease. And in that final chart, you can see that Bordeaux mixture gave probably a little bit under 50% of the yield of a conventional uh, fungicide, but all, an awful lot better than, of course, the non-treated control. So Bordeaux mixture can be effective on susceptible cultivars in severe epidemic years. There has been a little bit of uh, preliminary work done on uh, biocontrol of pecan scab using two different biocontrol agents. One is Bacillus mycoides, produced by Montana Microbial Products. The other is Bacillus subtilis, which is known as Serenade, produced by Ag AgriQuest. These two slides here um, are based on work done on uh, Bacillus mycoides, BMJ. Results using Serenade are comparable. They're not identical, but they're similar. And we can see in 2006 was a particularly wet year here on the left-hand chart. And you can see that the blue bar, which is the BMJ, gave pretty good control of uh, pecan scab. Uh, not quite as good as the conventional treatment, but still pretty, pretty good and similar in the other two years. And in 2006, uh, you can see as far as yield goes, there in the chart on the right-hand side, again, Pretty good improvement in yield, but uh, not as good as a conventional as a conventional uh, fungicide. So uh, finally, orchard hygiene. This is going to be a very limited use for pecan scab, simply because of the pathogen's capacity to multiply during the season. It's what is known as a polycyclic disease. It has multiple cycles during the year. And those cycles of reinfection happen so frequently that if conditions are correct, you don't need to very much inoculum to start with at the beginning of the season to end up with a major epidemic at the end. So although it can help um, by removing old shucks from the trees, uh, cleaning up trash from the, from the orchard floor, it's not going to be a solution for controlling scab. So I'd uh, now like to move on to another disease, uh, which is anthracnose. Very briefly, just uh, look at some recent tests on biocontrol of anthracnose. And again, uh, BMJ and Serenade have both shown some degree of efficacy against this particular pathogen. So there is some promising outlook there for control for organic production in areas where, or years where anthracnose may be a problem. As far as another disease that occasionally crops up on pecan, uh, that is powdery mildew. Sulfur is a very effective disease, um, applied at a rate of about four to six pounds per acre. And in one study by uh, Dr. Brenneman in 1988 at the University of Georgia, he found that uh, he got virtual complete control using uh, sulfur sprays. And as a result, there was no, no yield reduction. So a summary, really, of uh, here now of um, control of pecan scab and other Unmuted. Uh, of pecan. Really the best solution is planting resistant cultivars if that is an option and you're planting a new orchard. You want to avoid very susceptible cultivars in scab prone areas, but where you are converting an existing orchard of susceptible cultivars or a susceptible cultivar is being planted through choice, 
uh, then top working is always an option on the existing uh, uh, planting. Use of organically acceptable fungicides to control diseases is also a possibility. Biological control is a, an experimental possibility as well and will give some disease reduction. And orchard hygiene may well be of um, minor help with, particularly with uh, pecan scan. And that wraps up the pecan part of it. I'd now like to move on to peach diseases and spend the remainder of the time on that. Again, there are a lot of diseases that infect peach. You did. All of these are important in different parts of the country. There isn't time to cover all of these in detail or provide control solutions or updated control solutions on these. So I'm going to briefly cover these ones described here, which include brown rot, scab, bacterial spot, and then our malaria and peach tree short life, which are both uh, diseases or, or root related tree death diseases. And uh, although there are other diseases that are important, we won't have time to cover those today. And we'll start with um, just a brief uh, statement uh, from a disease perspective. Organic production of peach is pretty challenging, especially in wet environments. Uh, and an integrated approach is a necessity to manage the diseases of peach. And that, of course, includes resistant cultivars or rootstocks, using organically acceptable fungicides, effective orchard hygiene to minimize the amount of disease in the orchard, and using windbreaks for those diseases where wind and rain are important um, dispersal or infection agents. Starting with, the key, uh, with peach scab, uh, as for the current regulations from the USDA state that fruit will be downgrade, downgraded from a, a number one grade to a number two if there are more than four to six well-developed lesions on the fruit. If 10% or more of that fruit is uh, in a shipment has that kind of damage, the whole shipment will be downgraded. Now, as far as the epidemiology of the disease goes, um, canidia produced by the disease, uh, or by the pathogen from infected uh, twigs, and uh, those are produced from about uh, two weeks before shuck split till about three to four weeks after shuck split, as shown on that chart on the right, lower right-hand side. And it's really during that period when disease control measures are critical, during that window. And organically acceptable fungicides are available, and sulfur is one that um, has proven to be effective. There are no resistant cultivars and no other proven effect effective cultural approaches. Just to show you some results uh, from 2011 on the use of sulfur to control peach scab, uh, this is data from Dr. Phil Brennan at the University of Georgia. And just looking at that chart, if you look at the two red boxes, the upper one is the untreated control. The lower one is sulfur. The sulfur applied during a petal fall, shuck split, and then 10 cover sprays thereafter at about weekly intervals. You can see that there is a very significant reduction in the amount of disease. And the reduction in both the incidence and severity of disease equals that reduction that you would expect with the best uh, available conventional fungicides. So you can get very effective control of peach scab using sulfur. With brown rot of peach, again, a very important disease of the, of the uh, fruit. Sulfur is also very effective. And sprays need to be com commenced at the pink stage uh, at about six pounds per gallon. The sprays need to be repeated at full bloom, petal fall, shuck split, and then about seven cover sprays at sort of eight to 14 day intervals thereafter. Orchard hygiene is also very useful in controlling or managing peach scab. The shoots produce large quantities of canidia throughout the season, so removing infected shoots will be uh, effective in reducing inoculum. And removing old mummies from the previous season and those lying on the ground will also be effective at removing inoculum because this pathogen is so easily dispersed and readily dispersed in both wind and rain, and it can very quickly get out of hand if it's not effectively controlled. So really so keeping on top of the sulfur sprays and also uh, ensuring good uh, orchard hygiene will help reduce the risk from this disease, particularly when conditions are conducive for its uh, multiplication. Bacterial spot of peach is important uh, 
in some wet areas of the southeast. There is some resist caused by um, a bacterium, splash dispersed, and uh, that spray and splash can be wind driven. And if there are any injuries on the fruit or leaves, then infection will uh, rapidly occur. There, is a, there are some cultivars that have shown some resistance to this disease, including cultivars like Sentinel and Clayton. And cultural methods such as windbreaks can reduce the amount of damage and reduce the amount of bacteria being spread by wind and rain. However, copper and oxytetracycline, which is mica shield, uh, can both be used effectively to reduce the amount of disease here. And uh, these sprays need to be applied from the delayed dormant stage through um, early shuck split and then during fruit maturation. And here's a spray program um, in this uh, table, which des uh, describes the program to follow um, to achieve really the optimal control of this disease and the rates associated both with copper applications and also the microshield application. So the copper applications would be applied during the delayed dormant stage through shuck split and then microshield applications thereafter to ensure control. Now I'm going to uh, briefly cover both Almalaria uh, root rot and peach tree short life uh, and nematode control both in, both in one here. Uh, and this is the final part of the uh, presentation on peach. They, these are both major problems uh, in certain, at certain sites where Armillaria or peach tree short life has, has a historic um, uh, or is known historically to cause disease. On the left-hand side, we have typical symptoms of our malaria, tree death, uh, often the uh, mushrooms of the armillaria fungus being produced at the base of the tree. And if you were to uh, strip away the bark at the base of the tree, you would find the typical mycelia, a white sheet growing just underneath the bark against the hardwood of the tree. On the right-hand side, we've got peach tree short life symptoms. Uh, you have wilting of the foliage uh, and death of the tree on the above ground uh, portion and often very intense suckering from the roots because in the peach tree short life generally the roots will survive but the upper part of the tree will die and uh, peach tree short life is brought on often by a number of different factors but uh, nematodes uh, particularly uh, Mesocrichonema xenoplax is the species that's been associated with it and uh, pruning late in the season and or cold injury can lead to damage and ingress of um, a bacterium called Pseudomonas syringae that causes this uh, series of symptoms to develop the wilting and eventual death of the upper part of the tree and then of course suckering from the uh, below ground part that is still alive. And this is one of the things that can differentiate whole tree death between these two syndromes is the fact that the uh, peach tree short life uh, will result in suckering. Um, now resistant, cultivar, resistant rootstocks are available to help manage both of these. Orchard hygiene is critical, so it's important to remove old stumps and to make sure that the land is ripped effectively uh, to take out all of the roots that may also have sources of inoculum. Uh, remove all infected trees at the earliest possible opportunity and with peach tree short life, avoid pruning late in the season as this can lead to uh, injury through which uh, the bacterium can gain a toehold. As far as control of these two diseases go, I mentioned rootstocks are definitely a possibility. I want to home in here on one rootstock that has very recently become available. This is one uh, that has been bred by Dr. Tom Beckman here at the USDA. It is a clonal semi-dwarf plum peach hybrid. It's resistant to peach tree sheep sh uh, short life, armillaria, and root knot nematodes, and uh, apparently has excellent productivity and fruit size. Uh, and just to show, demonstrate how it uh, matches up against other existing rootstocks that are quite widely used for peach production, we refer to this table at the, in the bottom half of this particular slide. We're looking here at cumulative mortality due to those, due to those two factors, armillaria and peach tree short life and other factors causing mortality on three different rootstocks, MP29, which is the new one, 
out of the USDA lab, Guardian, which is an older rootstock, and Sharp, again, another historically fairly popular rootstock. If you look at MP29, you can see that 92%, after four years in the field, 92% of those rootstocks are still alive. None have died to our malaria or peach tree short life, and 8% have died due to other causes. With Guardian, 42%, about 50% of MP29, are still alive. 48% of those have died to our malaria. None have died to peach tree short life because Guardian is resistant to that, and about 10% have died to other so sources. With Sharp, 40% remain alive, but a large proportion have died to both our malaria and peach tree short life and other causes. So this shows how useful this new rootstock is uh, in providing protection against m many, if not most, of the common root-borne issues that peach suffers from. So it is certainly a, a very uh, good rootstock to consider if planting a new orchard. So at that point, I just, I'd like to uh, sum up regarding organic production. Unmuted. It can be very challenging because of the diversity of disease issues that are out there with this particular crop. Uh, but an integrated approach can be used to help manage diseases, and it should work as long as full use is made of those, op those options, including host resistance, using organically acceptable fungicides applied at the appropriate times, orchard hygiene, and cultural approaches such as windbreaks. And finally, I would just like to acknowledge uh, some of my uh, uh, collaborators and colleagues who have provided some slides and data and information for this presentation, and also some future research needs for organic control of pecan and peach diseases. Of course, there's always a long list there and a lot of things we would like to try and do, but resource is always a limiting factor. Uh, at this point, I would like to hand over to uh, Dr. Shapiro Alain and um, let him uh, fit, complete uh, the talk with his presentation on insect issues in organic pecan and peach. Thank you all very much. Okay, David, you should have control of the screen now. Whoops. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. You did. Um, as uh, Dr. Bach mentioned, I'll be discussing the organic methods for insect pest control in pecan and peach. And uh, here's a list of the primary pests that I'll be discussing in pecan. We have pecan weevil, the aphid complex, uh, lepidopterans, which would be uh, caterpillar pests such as hickory shuckworm, pecan nut case bearer. Uh, stink bugs, and then for peach, the plum coculio and peach tree borer. There are some other important pests, and it's going to vary by area, but due to time constraints as well as availability of organic options, these are the ones that I think most important to uh, focus on. And as I go through and talk about some of the approaches that we'll use uh, for organic uh, control, of pecan and peach insects, I think many of these approaches may be uh, adoptable for other cropping systems as well. So an overall theme to uh, emphasize would be that there are many natural enemies already in our orchards. We could call these the good guys. Um, we have um, both predators, uh, parasito parasitoids, as well as pathogens. Um, it's important to preserve these good guys um, as much as possible and enhance those that are already in the orchard. And then when necessary, when the pest population gets out of hand, we can use these agents as curative methods to suppress the pest population. So we have uh, predators such as our lady beetles and carabids on the top and the, the green lacewing predator as well, parasitoids such as the wasp parasitoid, which are, uh, you also have fly parasitoids. And then on the bottom, we have pictures of different pathogens or microbial agents that are beneficial, such as our beneficial or entomopathogenic nematodes, uh, fungi, bacteria, such as the Bt, and uh, nuclear polyhedrovirus or other viruses that help keep 
insect populations in check. So uh, starting out with pecan weevil, this is a major pest of pecan, particularly in the southeast as well as portions of Texas and the Midwest. The insect uh, has a two to three year life cycle. Most of that is going to be uh, uh, in the soil. So you have a long term in the soil where we could take advantage and target that pest with different curative agents. The adult insect uh, will come out of the ground, uh, most of them uh, peaking in mid-August to mid-September, though they can start to come out of the ground uh, in July. Once out of the ground, these uh, adult weevils will crawl, most of them will crawl to the trunk or fly to the trunk. Um, a small proportion might uh, go and fly directly to the canopy. The insects then feed and overposit inside the nut, that is they lay the eggs inside the nut, and then the larva develops in the nut and then comes out. So if you see these typical holes in the nut when you when you see pecans on, on the ground, that's likely from pecan weevil where the larva has exited. And those larvae, they can drop from very high in the tree and then uh, bounce onto the ground and then uh, burrow into the soil where they'll make a little cell and they're going to stay there usually for almost two years as they develop further, they pupate and become adults. Um, sometimes they'll actually remain in the soil for up to close to three years. So you have that two or three year life cycle, most of them with the two year life cycle. And uh, to control this pest, we have the option of microbial agents. Now these microbial agents are diseases of insects. So just like people get sick, insects can get sick as well, but we can use these insect diseases against the uh, uh, target pest. And the good thing about these diseases that attack insects is that they're not harmful to humans or the environment. And we'll have that we have the beneficial fungi, such as our white muscadine fungus and the green muscadine fungus, which are Bavaria bassiana and Metarhizium species. These are commercially available. Um, and they're used to control a wide variety of economically important pests, such as those here. Um, yep. We also uh, have a, a fungi that we're using now to try and control the pecan weevil. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you. OK. All right, so um, in Many of our orchards, we're fortunate enough to have uh, a high level of these beneficial fungi native in the orchard that are really contributing to, to the decimation of pecan weevil uh, populations. We've observed in some orchards 30 to 50 percent weevil mortality just from these endemic fungi such as Bavaria bassiana, that white muscadine fungus. In addition to the native fungi, we can apply uh, commercially available fungi to boost that population of fungus and, and cause an increase in mortality of the pecan weevil. So we've observed Muted. up to 80% mortality or even more over a two-week period uh, during the peak weevil emergence. The best way to apply the fungus, as we found, is directly to the trunk since most of the weevils are going to crawl to that trunk or fly directly to it. Or you can apply it to the ground uh, around the tree trunk uh, where weevils are emerging and it would be beneficial to have some kind of cover crop that helps protect the fungus. Whenever we apply any microbial agent, uh, uh, microbial pesticide or any biocontrol agent, it's important to use the appropriate rate of application. If you don't apply enough, then you may not get the uh, desired effect in terms of pest control. So in terms of fungi, we're talking about 10 to the 13th canidia or 10 to the 13th spores per hectare and for pecan weevil specifically probably at least two times 10 to the 13th per uh, treated hectare. Another thing that we found in terms of uh, the beneficial fungi Bavaria bassiana, that white muscadine fungus, is if you apply uh, if you have clover in the orchard, that's going to enhance the endemic fungi uh, 
by protecting it against UV radiation and so on. In fact, as you can see from the graph, in terms of plots that had endemic fungi plus clover, uh, you had a much higher level of, of the fungi compared to uh, endemic fungi that were in, in plots that had only bare ground. And you had, when you had uh, endemic fung uh, fungus with clover, you had equal amounts of fungus compared to if you applied commercial fungus there. So you really get a benefit from having clover in the orchard to act as a cover for your beneficial fungi. Move on, I'm moving on now to another microbial control agent, which are the entomopathogenic nematodes. And these fall, fall into two families, the stunnenomatidae and heterobdididae, uh, which are also uh, uh, have two genera, the stunnenomatids and the heterobdidids. And these entomopathogenic nematodes, which are also known as beneficial nematodes, are safe bio insecticides. They shouldn't be confused with the plant parasitic nematodes, such as those that Clive mentioned. These beneficial nematodes or entomopathogenic nematodes only attack insects. They don't harm the plant like these um, plant parasitic nematodes. Uh, the entomopathogenic nematodes only attack insects. And in fact, the uh, control to some extent the plant nematodes indirectly. Entomopathogenic nematodes generally don't harm beneficial insects such as your lady beetles or ground beetles and they can form positive relationships with other organisms in the soil such as with earthworms or sow bugs they'll form a phoretic relationship meaning that they'll be dispersed by these other organisms to help them move through the soil. So the nematodes will, these tiny little nematodes, which you can't see with the naked eye, will hitch a ride on earthworms to help disperse through the soil. A basic life cycle of these nematodes is they'll enter the insect host usually through natural openings, uh, the mouth, anus, or spiracles. Sometimes they'll go through the cuticle of the insect. Once inside, these nematodes will release a symbiotic bacteria into that insect uh, host. And the bacteria is the nematode's partner. It's an example of a true mutualism between that bacteria and the nematode. The bacteria helps to kill the host, the insect host, which will die within 24 to 48 hours. Then both the nematode and the bacteria will proliferate inside that dead insect. And you're going to get tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of new infective juvenile nematodes coming out of the dead insect ready to go out and find new pests to attack. So this is just a list of some of the commercial targets that beneficial nematodes are used against. Uh, citrus root weevils, black vine weevil, fungus gnats, mole crickets, white grubs, small hive beetle, which is a major pest of bees, western flower thrips, uh, coddling moth, cranberry gurgler, as well as a number of other insects shown here. And in applying any biocontrol agent, such as beneficial nematodes, it's important to remember that these are uh, live organisms, so we want to keep them alive and treat them uh, uh, carefully before application so that we don't kill them and prevent them from doing their jobs of pressing the pest population. So for nematodes, we, want, we can store them under refrigeration. Uh, and we can, that has to be under refrigeration. The length of storage will depend on species and formulation. But generally, it's going to be best to use the nematodes as soon as you can. Uh, the formulations that you'll buy the nematodes in are, are very uh, conducive to application. We just mix them with water and spray them. Or sometimes we have to strain the nematodes out. But it's generally pretty easy to use them. And they can be sprayed using most standard agricultural equipment or even put through uh, most irrigation systems. It may be necessary to remove fine filters or screens before applying the nematodes so they won't get shred. Uh, the nematodes are quite sensitive to desiccation, so we have to irrigate, keep that soil moist probably for at least two weeks 
uh, during the application or just at the application period and two weeks after. Uh, and we also want to avoid uh, direct sunlight or uh, oxygen deprivation, which is also detrimental to the nematodes. They have an optimum temperature range for activity between 68 and 84 Fahrenheit approximately, but some of the nematode species are a bit more flexible, being uh, more cold tolerant or more heat tolerant, just depending on species of the nematode. So in terms of using the nematodes against pecan weevil, we see that this particular species, Steinonema carpocapsi, is highly virulent, especially to adult weevils. Uh, when we applied uh, this nematode, Steinonema carpocapsi, three times per year, uh, we saw a vast reduction in the number of surviving weevils in pots that we seeded with, we with the pecan weevil larvae. Um, over two years, we saw only 1% of the weevils survive, and we put these pots out in the orchard and seeded them with the larvae, again, seeing only 1% weevil survival in pots, uh, which was significantly different from the untreated pots. Uh, and we also observed a high level of natural mortality in these pots, which uh, is expected. There are a lot of natural control agents that attack pecan weevil. But even in addition to the natural mortality, we observed 81% additional control from the nematodes. Moving on now to pecan aphids, uh, there are three species of, insect, of interest, the black pecan aphid, which causes uh, on the top right this typical yellow uh, patches on the leaf. Then you have the black margin aphid and yellow pecan aphid. These cause a sticky uh, uh, honeydew that you might notice on the leaves and maybe a black sooty mold. Very important in terms of pecan aphids, we want to conserve our natural enemies, such as the lady beetles. And you can see lady beetle larva on the left of, of the insects down on the bottom. And then uh, the lacewing larva and finally a parasitoid also can be an important natural enemy. So we want to conserve these natural enemies. They might be enhanced with certain cover crops or even sprays that would enhance natural enemies. And in terms of curative controls for aphids, some of the organic uh, soaps, oils, neem products may have some efficacy. I refer to this uh, website, which is a, uh, a good overall guide for many organic solutions. Um, also recently, uh, Dr. Ted Cottrell, who's another entomologist at our USDA research station, discovered that certain plant growth growth regulators can reduce development of black pecan aphids, so that may be an option. And then we've been working with this fungus, Isaria fumarosia, which shows virulence against all three uh, aphid species. In terms of Lepidoptera or caterpillar pests, we have pecan nut case bearer is a major one that can tunnel into uh, young shoots and feed on nutlets. It's very important to monitor for this pest. I refer you to the uh, website uh, Pecan IPM Pipe. A lot of good information on pecan, uh, especially on monitoring for this insect. And there have been thresholds for the insect uh, established in terms of when to treat. Hickory shuckworm, we have uh, another very important insect that um, attacks and uh, has to be monitored. You can see often on the ground, you'll see the fallen nuts with a white dot, which is indicative of the hickory shuckworm. And because it overwinters in old shucks, it's good to destroy these. So for control of our Lepidopteran pest, Bt, or the bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis, its byproducts uh, are um, uh, one option, they've been recommended for control of pecan nut case bearer, as well as two other uh, caterpillar pests, fall webworm and walnut caterpillar. Bt products may have a short residual time, so careful timing of the spray is necessary. Um, we also have our spinosad based products um, that are derived also from a natural bacteria. These can be this, these products can be very effective in controlling pecan nut case bearer as well as hickory shuckworm, and they've been registered for use against two of the other 
uh, Lepidopteran pests of fall webworm and walnut caterpillar. Stink bugs, we have three here shown of interest, the brown stink bug, green stink bug, and southern green stink bug. These are very difficult insects to control. Uh, I think one option would be using trap crops, and I refer to uh, another e-organic webinar by Russ Mizell, which gives a lot of good information on how to use trap crops, and as well as some publications uh, using mixed host species to attract the insects out of the orchard is the general idea. Um, but it's also important to note that some stink bugs are good guys, that is they're predators, natural enemies, so just because you see a stink bug in the orchard doesn't mean that it's a pest. And that wraps it up for the pecan insects. Moving on now to peach insect pests. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge some of these excellent co-investigators that have worked with me in developing organic solutions. So the first insect is a plum cuculeo, a major pest of stone fruits, of uh, peach, plum, cherries, but also uh, palm fruits such as apples and pears. The adult is the damaging stage. It's going to feed and then lay eggs in the fruit. The fruit drops and then the larva will develop in the soil. Uh, potential options for control uh, would be surround or kaolin based product as well as pyrethrum based products, Pyganic for example. Um, and I refer to this work by Michigan State uh, university. They've also been doing some interesting research on using hogs in the orchard to control uh, plum cuculeo. Uh, most of our work has been using on using beneficial nematodes suppress, to suppress the plum cuculeo. Uh, work also on nematodes showing efficacy would be from Diane Alston and Utah State University and then the laboratory of Mark uh, Whalen in uh, Michigan State. First thing that we did uh, in terms of using nematodes was to find the best nematodes uh, for killing that pest. That's always it's always important to remember that you want to choose the best nematode for a particular target pest. So we found two particular species of nematodes, SC or SR, S carpocapsi, S rio brava, highly effective against adults, and S felti and S rio brava, highly effective against larvae. Um, so S. rio bravo was effective against both, so we tested that one in the field, and we found that larval control or control of the ground dwelling stages with S. rio bravo is highly efficacious. We can get 100% control of the uh, larvae in the soil using this nematode, and this was also, uh, also high levels of control observed uh, at Michigan State University. But the problem is it's the adult that's the damaging stage attacking the fruit above ground. So if you're only applying nematodes to the soil, uh, you're going to expect some damage at least. So, so you're kind of expecting you're only going to suppress the subsequent generations. One potential solution is to have sentinel trees or trap uh, trees and develop an integrated program for control of the plum cuculeo, which we're pursuing. And we're pursuing this uh, with Tracy Lesky et al. in a specialty crop project. The idea is that we would have just several sentinel trees represented by these red dots, say three trees per hectare, for example. And you're going to attract the insects using natural uh, uh, volatile attractants to those particular sentinel trees, then apply some kind of curative. Um, and then when the fruit drops, so because you will have some fruit dropping, then you use the nematodes to clean up and kill all the larvae in the soil. So we're pursuing that approach, optimizing uh, for the best nematode to use across the eastern uh, um, plum cuculeo. And finding that's done in Maria Bravo again seems to be the best nematode for various soils and temperatures, though stun in felti is also effective. Moving on now to peach borer. This is a main pest of uh, 
small fruits. It's going to attack at the base of the tree and then girdle down into the roots. It's highly damaging, especially to young trees, which it can kill. Uh, there's also a lesser peach tree borer, which is closely related, but that one attacks above ground and may have potential for use, uh, to use nematodes against it as well. But here I'm presenting on the peach tree borer. And we see very high levels of control uh, against peach tree borer with Steinonema carbocapsi, both against young larvae and mature larvae, which means that you can use the nematodes in a preventative or curative fashion. For the curative approach, that means you already have the damage in the orchard and you want to stop additional damage and kill the pest before it emerges and can reproduce. You can just We found very high levels of efficacy with just 300,000 nematodes per tree. Um, and then in the preventative approach, we applied three times uh, nematodes, 300,000 per tree during the egg laying period uh, in the fall. We think this could be very economical because you're only applying the nematodes to the base of the tree or around the base of the tree as opposed to the entire acreage, which would be much more expensive. So some adoption of this approach has been initiated and we're trying to optimize now application uh, parameters. So just in summary of some of the research I presented, pecan weevil, we can see suppression using beneficial nematodes and fungi. The fungi can be enhanced if we use clover. Uh, for aphids, very important to conserve natural enemies. Uh, some curatives are available if needed. For the lepto lepidopteran pest, a uh, hickory shuckworm, pecan nut case bearer. For example, we want to monitor and use spinosad based products of Bt. Sting bugs may have uh, potential for control using trap crops. For Plumcaculio, beneficial nematodes such as S. rea brava may be effective. Uh, S. rea brava is showing the highest level of efficacy for that pest. And peach tree borer, uh, Steinonema carpocapsi is showing high levels of efficacy. We want to continue to optimize these existing tactics, also find new biocontrol approaches that work, and also improve methods to conserve natural enemies. Unmuted. I want to acknowledge all co-investigators again, as well as technical assistants, other research collaborators that, collaborators that have contributed to our results, as well as funding agencies. And with that, uh, we want to thank you very much for your attendance, and we'd be happy to answer any questions, both Clive and I. So with that, we'll move on to our questions. Um, this one is for Clive. Um, about, um, you had mentioned resistant um, pecan cultivars, and uh, we had a question about um, whether there were hardy cultivars for zone five um, that are resistant. It was for the first, for the first uh, part of your presentation. Uh, was that pe pecan cultivars? Yes, it was. I'm against, against scab. Um, I do not know the answer to that question directly, um, whether or not there is a resistant cultivar in that zone. I would guess that some of the normal cultivars would grow in that zone adequately well, um, but I don't, I, I'm not sure. The place to get that information though will be on one of those links that was in the presentation on the uh, pecan resistance uh, page or slide. At the base of that, I had a couple of links, one to the University of Georgia uh, pecan, resist, uh, pecan breeding site and the other to the USDA pecan breeding site. And on both of those, the cultivars are listed in detail as to what their characteristics are and um, the, the areas to which they're best adapted. And I don't have a a cultivar specifically that I know off the top of my head that would be perfect in that particular zone. But I think that uh, a number of those that were listed under resistant, the six or seven resistant cultivars such as Lakota, uh, Pawnee, uh, some of those would, for example, Excel, Mandan, would probably fit into that, into that zone as well. Okay, thank you. Um, here is a question from um, 
a listener who tried the parasitic nematode to manage peach tree borers, but it was not so effective. Um, could that be due to their arid weather? Um, yes, that's definitely a possibility. There's a number of reasons why it may not have worked. Um, as I had mentioned, though, in terms of arid weather, that that can be overcome through irrigation. So if the soil is very dry before applying the nematodes, I would irrigate at least a little bit beforehand and then uh, apply the nematodes and then irrigate thereafter for at least a two-week period. Um, other possibilities would be uh, it, it's important to use the correct or, or the most appropriate uh, species of nematode. We found so far that Steinanium acopicapsi has been the most effective, though there may be some other ones that work as well. Um, and then it's uh, sometimes just th some of those general considerations, taking care of the nematodes and making sure that they're actually viable before application uh, can also be a factor that would affect the efficacy. Okay, we have another question about um, nematodes. Um, are they harmed by treated or chlorinated tap water, or is it better to use unchlorinated water? Um, that's a good question, but generally they should not be affected. Anything that we're drinking, you know, should be fine. Um, they're, they're really pretty tough uh, when it comes to that, and in fact, that if anybody does use any kind of chemical uh, insecticides, um, they, they can ha uh, many of those they are even compatible with um, so so they are pretty tough and I wouldn't worry at all about the tap water that should be fine to use okay um, here's a question about um, Bavaria bassiana um, with 80 percent mortality rate of the weevil how does that translate to the percent of damaged nuts that's a good question too um, we have not measured that uh, we, we've just been capturing the weevils and then seeing how many of them die. It's a, it is an important point that, you know, the fungus will take up to a week uh, to kill the pest. So during that time, there's potential damage being caused. So um, whether or not Bavaria can be used just as a standalone by itself um, has not been established. Uh, you are going to incur some damage from from the Bavaria, but we have shown that you're also going to get some, uh, I mean, when you're using Bavaria, you will incur some damage, but you'll also obtain some benefit. We haven't really measured the, uh, the overall crop protection level from the fungus, just the weevil mortality. Okay. Um, we have two questions coming in about um, how you might be able to control curculio with um, different animals. Um, for example, um, the first one is about the use of guineas or other fowl or poultry to assist in control. And then another person was wondering about whether hogs could be used to help um, solve the problem. Yes. Um, you know, I showed that slide with the Michigan State University and, and that website. I would refer the, the uh, uh, listeners to that. Um, Michigan State University has shown definitely some efficacy using the hogs, and I'm not familiar with using uh, guinea hens specifically, but I would think that they're going to be, you know, predators as well and may have some efficacy. Um, so I think I would go directly to those experts, but I know um, they have seen uh, some levels of efficacy with those uh, uh, animals in terms of predation of the plum cuculeo. Um, here's one more question for Dr. Shapiro Ilan. Um, has he any research or does he know of any anyone using the practice of air blasting water on pecans, um, pecans for control of aphids? Air blasting just water? That's what it says. Oh, no, I haven't heard that. I mean, you know, if you can get the aphids off, you know, you may get some and you're probably, you know, you're going to have to get them off the tree. You may get some benefit, but I, I would think that's going to be fairly short term before they, you know, make a comeback. So um, I haven't seen any research on it, but my guess is you you wouldn't be able to get a high level of control doing that. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Are there any other fungicides besides sulfur available for brown rot on peach in organic production? 
to the best of my knowledge, uh, no sulfur is the is the most effective one that's used and the one that is recommended in most situations for for control under organic situations. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions on where you might purchase nematodes? Um, you know, from USDA perspective, we can't recommend one uh, distributor over another. There's a number of commercial distributors, and if you just Google beneficial nematodes, um, you'll see uh, a number of distributors or companies come up. Um, and many of them have uh, good products, and you could just compare um, the the uh, prices and uh, and make sure that you're using the uh, correct species and appropriate rates. If anybody wants to contact me for additional information on nematode use, they're certainly welcome to. Yeah. Okay. You can also ask that in the Ask an Expert, and we'll be very glad to get you the answer. Um, we can also post um, some resources on that as well. Um, so are there any storage issues with the biological products? Um, should, should they be stored out of direct sunlight or in a cool place? Um, can you make some suggestions? Yeah, I mean, and any of the microbial, well, really, let's say the microbial pesticides like nematode and fungi, nematodes and fungi are going to store best under refrigeration um, and definitely out of the sunlight. Out of sunlight, um, the nematodes you wouldn't want to store them in a spray tank for a long period because they do need oxygen. So you probably want to get them out of your spray tank within about an hour. Um, so those those are definitely some issues to consider. Some of the fungus formulations actually can be stored uh, at room temperature too for short periods. But the nematodes, um, if you are going to store them, it'd be best under refrigeration. Okay, well, thank you very much for your questions. And um, I'd like to thank um, David Shapiro Alon and Clive Bach for coming and giving this presentation today. And um, one more time, I'd like to say that we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out our follow up survey after the presentation. So thank you for coming again, and thank you all for joining us.